Uh, good evening. Before we start tonight's program, I would like to start with a few housekeeping notes. First, relax, grab a snack, your favorite beverage, and enjoy. I would like to remind you that this evening's series is being recorded as indicated by the red dot in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. We understand that, be, that recording may be an issue for some and that you may choose to leave the meeting. Please check your screen identification to make sure that is correct. If you use the link that was sent out today instead of the link you received when you registered, you are most likely identified as Liz. Uh, please also confirm that your identification reflects how you best wish to be recognized using preferred pronouns and professional association. Uh, you may edit all of that information by clicking on the three dots next to your name in the participants tab, uh, then click on rename. Note that live captioning is turned on. If you wish to not see captioning ah. and your version of Zoom allows, you can click on the arrows to the right of the CC button and then on hide. Note that Zoom is doing the auto captioning so we'll not capture everything accurately. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this, the fourth in a seven part series titled Wasted, Small Efforts for Big Change. The program is planned around a series of conversations about waste, environmental justice, and the role that we all play in the future of sustainability. I'm Tony Marino, Executive Director of the Rockwall Foundation. Founded in 1935, our mission is to promote and support environmental education and conservation in the lower Connecticut River Valley. Please go to rockfallfoundation.org to find out more. Rockfall has been pleased to collaborate with the following co-sponsors, City of Middletown, Lower Connecticut River Valley Council of Governments, better known as RiverCog, and Wesleyan University Sustainability Office. This program could not have happened without the assistance of many individuals, in particular, Cheryl Baldwin, Janice Elimeyer, Jen Kleindienst, Kim O'Rook, and members of the Rockfall uh, Program Committee. A special shout out to Liz Brittany and the, uh, the Communications and Grants Coordinator at Rockfall, as she will be managing the mechanics of each of our programs, and to Michelle Ekman, uh, Program Consultant to Rockfall. Thank you to all of them. Just a reminder that our next program in this series is on April 22nd. Uh, for an advocacy workshop with Lou Birch, Connecticut Program Director, uh, Citizens Campaign for the Environment, Marilyn Cruz Aponte, Assistant Director of Public Works for the City of East Hartford, and Kevin Burgess, Attorney for the Zero Waste Project at the Conservation Law Foundation. Please sign up for that event or any of the other remaining sessions by using the link that Liz will now put in the chat or on any of our social media posts that we have sent or by visiting our website again at rockfallfoundation.org. We acknowledge the heritage of the indigenous people of the state of Connecticut. We understand, yes we do, except it just disappeared. Okay, I can do this. We acknowledge the heritage of the indigenous people of the state of Connecticut. We understand that the issues we discussed throughout this series acknowledge the responsibility we hold for social and environmental justice and the protection of the natural resources on their land on which we live, work, and play. The theme of tonight's discussion is, let's get going, Waste Audit Workshop. I would like to welcome Michelle Ekman, who will lead us in today's program. Michelle, take it away. I am here, thank you so much, Tony. Um, and welcome to all of you. I'm so glad to have all of you here. And um, just to give you a little background on me, I uh, got to know Tony and the Rockfall Foundation a number of years ago um, and was a, a grant recipient. Um, and Tony and I um, did a lot of great work together in the course of those years. Um, and uh, when I kind of struck out on my own and started my own gig in in the summer um, we kind of put our heads together and thought about how can Rockfall um, grow in their work as funding some really amazing environmental education programs as they've been doing for a really long time um, and shifting to you know adding their own environmental education programs to the work they do and this is a you know, the, the fruit of that effort 
And um, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, I love, you know, for those, there's family members of mine on this session and they know full well that I live, breathe, um, exist in um, thinking about the environment and how I can reduce my impact on it. And so I just want to let you know that um, I'm going to do my best to not talk your ear off. I want you to ask questions. I want you to feel free to raise your hand. I'm going to keep my eyes on um, the screen. Um, instead of just putting questions into the chat, which you're totally free to do if you're not comfortable with like raising your hand and, and asking a question out loud, though that so you know, that's that's what I prefer. Feel free to do it. Um, I want this to be an open dialogue. I don't want this to me be me sitting here talking at you because that's kind of boring. Um, I really want this to be a workshop. Um, and uh, but if you're not comfortable asking out loud, feel free to put that in the chat, and Jen will um, kind of you know, make sure that I see your question and we'll get that addressed. You don't have to wait for me to ask you to ask questions. You can jump in at any time. Um, I'm going to be showing, you know, sharing my screen and sharing some things. Um, and there might be some points where you're like, hey, I can you show that to me again? I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I have resources to share. Uh, and I like, let's just learn together. Um, and if there is a question that you have that I can't answer, I don't, you know, don't be afraid to ask. And I'm not afraid to tell you I don't know, because if I don't know, that gives me an opportunity as well to learn too. So um, I don't purport to be the expert on waste, but I have been involved in, in environmental work for a really long time. So it's kind of what I think about constantly. So um, with that, how many of you, you can raise your hand and if you don't know how to raise your hand, there's a, the bottom of your screen, if you just use your cursor, um, there's a, a, an icon that says reactions, a little smiley face and a plus, just click on that. And there's a raised hand button there. Um, just go ahead and click on that. Um, go ahead and raise your hand if you have done any of your waste audit and you have it ready sitting right by your side. Raise your hand. Okay, good. Anyone else? Actually, only okay, partial. This, what's that? <laughs> only partial. That's okay. That's totally fine. Um, this is, I'm not grading on this. Um, uh, but, you know, I'm happy to, what I'm going to do is, is to show you kind of how it has wor worked for me where I live. Um, and in my home, I want you all to keep in mind, I live alone. So what you see on my table is what I've produced in waste for um, the past little bit. Um, don't think that like, oh God, look at how little she's producing compared to me. I live, I live alone. And so my footprint is a little bit different. Um, what else is I going to say? Oh yeah. So if you want to have your sheet, follow along. Um, I will try to keep my eyes on your faces for those of you who have your cameras on to see if you start falling asleep because I don't want to put you to sleep. Um, so we're going to start with looking at the waste audit. I'm going to show you the things. I'm going to weigh some things. We're just going to do that. I'm going to show you um, a little video I made about how to dispose of some of our items. And I've got a bunch of resources to share along the way. And um, I'm going to kind of toggle back and forth. So um, I am going to ask right now, are there any questions? All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So can everybody see my screen? I've got my home waste audit worksheet up. You can go ahead and nod your head or something. Okay, good. All right, so um, like I said, I live alone. So my waste generation is a little bit different. Um, as you may see, I have, um, and I cannot see myself right now. So if somebody could let me know, can you see the waste on my dining room table. I think you have to not share your screen for us to see the waste at the same time. Oh, right. Okay. Well, let me just show you what I've calculated thus far. OK. 
Okay. Um, so just to review real quick. Here we go. Okay, good. Just to re you'll go over really quick. Um, in the state of Connecticut, and I believe it's the same in Massachusetts because I know we have some Massachusetts people on the, on the Zoom today. Um, your single stream recycling are the items that, um, you know, the, the typical plastics, car, clean cardboard, um, and that term is, you know, we'll, we'll use that term a little loose, clean a little bit loosely right now. Um, your glass, your aluminum, and so forth. The specialty recycling are other items that um, really need to be recycled, but wouldn't go in a recycle bin. Things like batteries, film plastics, um, uh, the electronic recycling. You're not going to put those things in a recycle bin, but there are ways and means to recycle them. If you're putting anything in the trash in the state of the Connecticut, the chances are it is going to a waste to energy incinerator. Um, well, most likely that's going to be in Bridgeport, which is the next town over from where I live, or it's going to be going to Hartford. The majority of our um, solid waste goes to those locations. Food waste, if you are composting, I have separated out here, but if you are not composting, then you would put that into your incinerator column. Okay, so just so you know how this is all broken out. All right, so I am gonna show you how I go ahead and calculate. Now I have this um, kitchen scale that I use at home. I bake bread and so um, I, this is the only scale I have in my home. Maybe you're like me, I don't feel like I want another scale in my home. So this is what I've been using to measure um, the weight of my various categories of waste. So here I've got, and hopefully you can see this, I have got my items that are going to go to the incinerator. So I've got an, a hanger that I've fixed a couple times but just doesn't want to be fixed anymore. I've got my takeout food container. No, that cannot be recycled. I've got a wrap from a muffin. I've got a piece of cloth. I've got um, this piece of metal. These items cannot be recycled. I could try to repurpose them in other ways, but for the purposes of this conversation, these are gonna go in my incinerator column. Now over here, I have items that are in my, were in my recycle bin. So I've got my oat milk container. So these, yes, indeed are recyclable. I've got this loose cap. This loose cap, I'm going to point out here and now, these caps can be recycled, but they have to be attached to the bottle. No loose caps, okay? No loose caps. Put that on your bottle and that will all be recycled. I've got some takeout containers. I've got some paper. Okay, I've got some mail. Next, here's a specialty recycling item. It's a bread bag. I don't know if you've ever tried Dave's Killer Bread. It's super good. Um, that's a specialty item. That cannot go into the trash or shouldn't go into the trash. It cannot go into the single stream recycling bin. And then I have a, uh, a uh, community compost system going on here. I have hired a service that comes every week and collects my compostables. So I've got compostable parchment paper in here. I've got some uh, pizza crust, because I'm not really into the pizza crust. I really just like the tomato and cheese and such. Um, I've got some takeout containers that are compostable. Um, so yeah, and then any of my other food waste. The great thing about community um, composting is they do accept meat, which is not something you would necessarily want to do at home. So these are my categories, and it's really as simple as um, you know, you could put each of your categories, and if you've looked at the waste audit that I um, sheet that I put together, an easier way to do this is to put all of a single category into a bag and stick it onto your scale and, and get the weight of it. I didn't do that because um, I brought all my plastic bags to the um, the proper place, which you'll, you'll see a little video about in a moment. 
So um, here I've got 3.6 ounces of incinerator waste. And I could go on, but I hope this gives you an idea of how this works. So I would record in my waste audit. Let's share this again. That in my incinerator, 3.6 ounces. I will, I can do the math later on how that translates to pounds. This is a great opportunity to flex some of your math muscle if you haven't done that for a little while. And so some facts that I think are really important to understand in terms of like, okay, what's the point of us doing this? Why do we want to do a waste audit? Why do we want to investigate how much we're composting, how much we're recycling, how much we're putting in an incinerator and, or potentially in Massachusetts it could be going to a landfill. Well, all of how we just, how we, how we buy things, what we do with the things that we buy, um, all has an impact on how much greenhouse gas is put into the atmosphere. So, for everything that is incinerated, there is a carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas output. I'm gonna be focused on carbon dioxide um, for the purposes of this conversation, but we also have issues in this country with methane um, and, and uh, various other um, greenhouse gases that uh, are, are contributing to forming this kind of blanket on our planet that prevents heat from escaping to the outer solar system. So when we are putting things into uh, our just solid waste stream, our, our, our trash, it's not going to be recycled, it's not going to be composted, there is a carbon footprint associated with that. And part of that carbon footprint is associated with the actual incineration and it is also the all there's also a transportation feature of this. So according to the Union of Concerned Scientists, um, as well in the EPA, I just want to let you know what some of my sources are. Um, for essentially every pound of waste that it goes to what's called a, a waste to energy facility, which is what we have in Hartford's what we have in Bridgeport. For every pound that is incinerated, approximately 1.2 pounds of carbon dioxide is admitted into the atmosphere. Each household um, produces about four tons of waste annually. So you can do that math. Now, if we are really concerned about reducing our carbon footprint, Certainly transportation in the state of Connecticut, and I believe that is also true in Massachusetts, transportation emits more carbon dioxide than any other activity that we do, but waste is not too far down the list. And if we're thinking about how can I reduce my carbon footprint, reducing the amount of waste we produce is a big part of that. Um, recycling is an important activity. Um, the EPA considers single stream recycling to be a negative greenhouse gas emissions process. And that is largely because recycling materials into a secondary product displaces almost on a, a two time scale, the production of a primary or virgin product um, from its um, Act, acquiring those resources, harvesting those resources, creating those resources, and then getting them to the consumer. So recycling, reusing, reducing is extraordinarily important. I personally like to put a number to my input. So okay, I just got booted. Well, the, you well, there we are. Yeah. Welcome back. I momentarily got booted. Um, so uh, I didn't even get a warning that my, um, I have poor quality. So um, 
I don't know what you missed. It's kind of like when a call drops and I just keep talking. I don't know what you what, what you all missed, but um, I was I was saying that um, I like to have a, a number associated with my impact because I want to be able to calculate and find ways to reduce it. And so I'm going to go real quick back to my waste audit. So I can look at where, you know, out of my totals, right? So I'm, I'm in my single stream recycling, I am creating almost the same amount of poundage as my incinerator waste. Obviously, incinerate, incinerator waste is what we want to reduce. If you are motivated, um, as I am, or maybe hopefully you'll be more motivated um, by the time we are done with this session, um, that is the column that you want to reduce. Because if you look at the estimated CO2 output from your single stream recycling or from your composting, you've got zero. And in fact, if you want to really be mathematically accurate, you would actually have negative because um, the, the organic matter in compost actually absorbs carbon dioxide. So um, but I'm wearing, I get all that technical right here. All right, so I had uh, mentioned to you about this film recycling. I showed you my little bag of um, Dave's killer bread, my empty package. Um, I'm gonna look around the room real quick though. Um, to see if there are any raised hands. I don't see any raised hands. No questions yet. Am I that straightforward? Okay. All right. Cool. So um, this is like a pet peeve of mine. I, I will look around to see what my neighbors are putting in their compost bin, but I also try to mind my own business and I try not to go around and tell them what they need to do. But um, these plastic bags um, are... The reason why they cannot go into single stream recycling is they'll actually jam up the machine. They'll jam it up and everything will need to be tossed that's in, in its wake. And that kind of defeats the entire purpose. So because I'm a goofball, um, I made a little video that I'm gonna share with you. For those of you who may not know what to do with your film plastic, um, I'm going to share with you my, my little journey. Are you ready to go on a journey? A soul journey? What to do with all those plastic bags, whether they're from the grocery store or they were wrapped around a new kitchen appliance. If you've got a plastic bag, sounds a little bit like this, looks a little like this, please don't put them in the recycle bin. And please don't even put them in your trash bin. There is an easy way to dispose of them in the right way. And something really great will come out of it in the process. Follow me. You may be asking, uh, if I don't put them in the recycle bin, and I probably shouldn't put them in the trash bin, what do we do? So I keep my bag of bags in my kitchen hallway closet. You could keep them in any other location where they Nicole, are. Can you pause? Yeah. Well, we're, we're doing a video, but we can't see it. Pandemic. But however, you probably just don't want them sitting out and about. They're not like the most trash. You can't see it? It was showing the like editing. Um, when I the... think it might be that when you went to share it in a larger screen, it like opened it in a different window and you were still sharing the first window. Oh, I bet you're right. I've had that happen to me before. Lots of things happen to me in Zoom. <laughs> Bear with me a moment. We've all learned with Zoom. We all need to be very flexible. Uh -huh. All right. If I could just get you all back. 
Um, in the meantime, while I'm futzing with this, does anybody have any questions? Jen, if you could look at the chat and see if there are any there. There are no questions. Okay. Uh, this is Ron Capozzi. I have some questions. I am on the DIMIAC board uh, in the Durham Middle Field, and we do not use uh, a single stream. We use dual stream of paper and cardboard in one and all the plastics and glass in another. Uh, so we don't get cross-contamination between uh, glass and the uh, cardboards. Um, we do not uh, see re uh, recycle the films. People know uh, better not to put them into the recycle bin. Uh, see, while we're doing the trash to energy, the films get uh, burned, uh, but that's coming to an end very quickly. And uh, it makes uh, from a uh, Dimiac perspective, no sense to collect the plastic film because they are, uh, they have almost no weight at all. And uh, we don't have a compactor to, you know, compact things. And as you said before, it's a specialty uh, um, stuff. And um, we do do some specialties like uh, electronics, tires, um, oil, um, and various other things, uh, a demo, uh, we do, we have a, uh, something for a brush that brings it, uh, into, uh, a mulch, um, and we collect leaves, uh, and where we, uh, compost them, uh, on site. Uh, we also provide uh, see composters for people at 50% discount to, from what you can buy them on Amazon for the members of Durham and Middlefield. Uh, and we encourage everybody to compost on site at home rather than doing uh, a municipal uh, composting. Uh, which we really don't have much room for. It would have to reconfigure the entire site. Um, let's see, and one of our nevesis is having, uh, see, multiple, um, multiple uh, packaging for a single thing. For instance, uh, aluminum can and a and steel top. Uh, that's not good for recycling, uh, or having those milk cartons that uh, we used to use, used to be all cardboard, no longer. And uh, even though the cardboard uh, milk cartons can be uh, recycled, uh, as you said earlier, the caps can uh, are too small to be uh, put into the uh, recycling thing, and so. Uh, if you put them in, you screw the tops back on the milk cartons, they really need to be thrown away. Um, I, I do a lot of repurposing um, because I'm a gardener and almost all my cardboard goes uh, into the garden for um, mulching and stuff. Uh, and that way I don't have to worry about the... Uh, uh, whether it's clean or it's dirty. Um, and I even have uh, some rodents in my backyard that uh, clean out the empty uh, uh, peanut bar jars before I throw them into the recycling containers. Um, so, uh, let's see. Has Thank you so much. Those dual are purpose. great suggestions. Uh, and since I have a uh, fireplace insert, I uh, use my cardboard uh, um, see toilet rolls, fill them with uh, see the lint from my dryer, and then use them to start up my fires. Um, oh, I see you're back, so I'll I'll stop talking and let you get get on with your program. Thank you so much for those suggestions, Ron. Very helpful. All right, can you see again, again, Michelle, um, Catherine just put in the chat, 
um, noting about plastic drop-off locations in mm -hmm. if people aren't sure where they can bring plastic film. Um, the so, plasticfilmrecycling.org is a place to look. It is. That's one of the resources I was going to share. Um, can you see that I have my video up yet? It's showing the same screen as before, oh, so we just see a where would the video would be. I guess there's, there's, there's just still pictures every few minutes, so we can okay, actually- Okay, yeah, you're seeing my editing. Well, as you can tell, like I only have a, a, a limited amount of expertise with um, technology. So as I basically was taking, and what I'm gonna try to do is I'll put it together um, and it will go out with the recording. Um, took a little journey on um, where you can find the film repos the film plastic uh, locations. So I went to my local Stop and Shop, and I went to my local Big Y, and I went to my local Shoprite, and they were all within a few feet of the entrance. Um, and so. An important thing to know, um, and so what ends up happening with the companies that utilize these bags, they actually will purchase them from the grocery stores. Something important to know though is not every plastic bag is a candidate for going into your film recycling. Um, so the kind of the rule of the thumb is, is the sound. So if it's not super, super loud, when you crinkle it up and if you can stick your thumb and stretch you can put it into the film recycling uh, bin at your grocery store. Um, most of the um, grocery stores in our state have these bins. I was made aware just today that I think due to COVID uh, they have removed those bins um, and hopefully they'll become available. So what do you do if you live in an area where there are none of those? Um, I'm gonna say like you can come take a visit to Stratford, Connecticut where I found um, three within about 20 minutes today. Uh, we can hang out in my backyard for a little while, um, social distance and we go on a little journey. Um, because the really cool thing is another thing I put into the video is um, the most popular use for these bags is to be converted into composite lumber, um, which, you know, some of the brands that I'm familiar with are like Trex. Um, the great thing about those is it, you're not having to cut down trees to, for this lumber. I mean, every, every, you know, product has its, its pros and its cons. Um, but the composite wood, um, the composite lumber will last, obviously it's plastic, it will last forever. So you don't need to like replace um, falling apart benches and so forth. So um, before I continue, I see two hands. So the first hand that I saw was Brenda. So um, Brenda, you can go ahead and then what you got? Actually, it's kind, of, it's kind of a little bit back from where you were before. What about, um, you know, the plastic bags that are in cereal, or I don't know if they're really plastic. I don't even know what they are, in cereal boxes? Is that something you can bring to that or is that just regular garbage? You know what, I'm gonna, this is, um, I'm gonna now share my screen again. Okay. Um, can you see uh, a website um, that yeah. is yep. the state of Connecticut? Can you see um, Recycle CT? Yes. Okay, so this is a phenomenal website, um, RecycleCT.org, it couldn't be simpler. Um, in Massachusetts, the counterpart to that is RecycleSmart.org. And basically you can put into a search. So I'm gonna say serial bag. I'm not sure if this is going to come back. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. Plastic liner. If clean and dry, put it, uh, bring to a participating retailer for recycling. But now I'm going to pop over to this other site that I think um, you may, uh, Catherine, I think may have put into um, the chat, which is this plastic film recycling um, website. 
and you look, can look through this site and figure out which types of plastic bags can mm. go through those. Um, let's see if... I can tell you that cereal box liners are not allowed. I figure because they, they make a lot of noise. Well, they are the, the, I'm, hi, I just want to say I'm Catherine Bruns. I'm West Hartford's Recycling Coordinator. And I just did a workshop with the wrap recycling people last week. And the real test is if you can push your finger through it. And the cereal box liner is too stiff. So okay. Ziploc mm -hmm. bags. And the one I wanted to point out that's really interesting is these Amazon mailers are 100% plastic. And we're doing a lot of those in the um, pandemic, a lot of people ordering. And so mm -hmm. these go in with plastic film recycling. People are always excited to know about that. And then the bubble wrap, too. Yep, the bubble wrap. Yep. Hmm. But, but bags like this can't. These are called flexi pack and they can't go in. You know, that nuts are in or dog food or maize. Right, right, right. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Catherine. Okay. Um, did that okay. answer your question, Brenda? It is yes. left that you can recycle plastic cereal box liners. And that's what I've heard as well from. Um, Kim O'Rourke in the city of Middletown that as long as it, patch, it passes that stretch test then you're okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And 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 as Cheryl Baldwin from DEEP, um, the Department of Environmental Protection has said, and it's kind of become mantra of mine in my head, when in doubt, throw it out. Because mm -hmm. if you put something in your single stream recycling bin that cannot be recycled, the whole thing gets tossed. And that, again, defeats the purpose. So um, in some yeah. particular cases, less is more. And it's really, it's not so much about like, what can I put in my recycle bin? That's not really like the thought process that I would encourage. I would encourage the thought process to be like, what am I buying? And how much packaging is there going to be associated with it? Right? Okay. Because if there's a ton of packaging associated with it and I'm not going to be able to repurpose it, then I'm going to have to dispose of it. And that's like, mm, it kind of, that reducing, the reducing our, our, our use, the reducing the amount of packaging, that's really like the first thing. And then, okay, if I've got this thing that I no longer need, what are the other options that I can, instead of putting it somewhere um, where, you know, ultimately carbon dioxide and other green, greenhouse gases are emitted, thus therefore contributing to more of our um, global warming problem. Um, so Catherine, you had raised your hand. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. Um, did you still have a question? Nope, it was, I was just going to share the, um, Amazon mailer thing because. Okay, awesome. That's something often people don't know. Okay, great. Wonderful. And I put the website link in the chat if people need to look there. You can put your, um, zip code in there and see what stores right around you. Uh, have drop-off locations. We had a drive in West Hartford uh, just before COVID started and they were collecting for a, um, a town bench. And so people were really collecting and then COVID happened and, the, and temporarily the, the drop-off locations were closed down. People were shocked at how much, if, once they started saving it and didn't have somewhere to go, the bags were massive. So it's actually quite a lot more than you would think and it is recyclable, just not in your curbside. So mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of eye-opening to hang on to how much plastic film you have. And, and like Michelle said, if you can choose to purchase things without it, that's better, but we often don't have a choice. Yeah, I, you know, with continued access, I still tend to stockpile and I always forget to bring it out to my car with me, but I weighed it, my bag, and I only had one bag of bags and I weighed it and it was two pounds. Yeah, it's, it's a lot because I would it's bring it from town hall down to the department yeah. it works. It's shocking. Yeah, I, I have a collection because I'm doing a demonstration next week, so I've been collecting it. But Oh, cool. That's great. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Um, other specialty recyclable items. Um, things to think about in terms of what you buy. So batteries. Um, rechargeable batteries are so much more accessible these days than, you know, I had a really struggle years ago finding a charger, number one, 
And then I could only find AA and AAA batteries that were made in a recyclable form. But more and more types of batteries are recyclable. Um, and it's much easier to find uh, battery uh, chargers that will charge even D batteries. Um, there's AAA, AA, and there's a few others that I can put in my charger. So whatever you do, do not throw away your batteries. Um, that is hazardous waste that needs to go um, in your hazardous waste disposal. I'm just going to say that. Please do not throw them away because um, that gets incinerated and um, whatever heavy metals are in that battery get burned and that goes into our air. And if you, any of you are at our first session, you heard Sharon Lewis and um, the folks from the uh, Connecticut Coalition for um, Environmental Justice, like the people in Bridgeport, the people in Hartford, they bear the brunt of that's not fair. I mean, we will all breathe the same air, but um, I want you to be thinking about, um, and I'm gonna encourage you to talk to the people in your life to think about you know, when you put something um, that is going to a landfill or going to an incinerator, there are people less fortunate than you most likely that are going to be impacted by that. So there's the, the climate change part of it, but there's also the environmental justice part of it. And it is it is very important that we keep these things in mind. You're frozen again. Question? I heard a voice. Okay. Um, all right, I wanted to share a few more resources with you. Um, this is gonna be in the recording, but you can get in touch with us. I'm happy to share anything else um, by email. Um, I mostly just want people to find their way in waste reduction and reduction of the carbon footprint. So whatever I can do to make that happen, I am I'm happy to. So, um, there's this film recycling um, website, so fil plasticfilmrecycling.org, recyclect.com. Sorry, I said .org before. It's recyclect.com. Um, you can easily access it from your mobile phone. You can get it here. Um, I wanted to, to bring this other um, issue up. This, you know, had a conversation earlier today with some pretty awesome folks about, um, you know, what do we do with, you know, if, if I see a number inside of a recycle symbol, doesn't it mean it's recyclable, right? I see a number seven, there's a recycle, the three, you know, the triangle of arrows, it, it must mean that it's recyclable and that is not necessarily the case. So that number that is on a plastic only is like, it's like an internal code in the plastic industry. And it has to do with the resins that are used to get a certain pliability or strength of plastic based on its use, right? So you know that when you buy, um, you know, let's say a plastic bag that, you know, where your bread is, you need pliability, but you don't want a bag like this, you know, plastic like this for your laundry detergent. So there's different resins to make things um, at a certain strength that doesn't tell you, right? This is not a communication to a consumer about whether it's a recyclable or not. Um, in most cases, your ones and twos are going to be recyclable. We've been learning that. But threes to sevens, um, you really have to look at your municipality or what your hauler is. For those of you who um, have a company that comes to pick up your waste, you'd have to check with that hauler to see if they process plastics three through seven. So don't just take it for granted that if it's got a number on it with that that triangle on it, that it's recyclable. Um, there's also um, the, on the ct.gov portal, um, they have more discussion about plastic containers number three through seven. Um, the plastic cap thing is an issue. Um, you can either, if you wanna um, leave your container empty so it can dry, that's fine. 
but you know, you're, you're better off probably putting that into the trash. If you're going to put it in recycling, it has to be attached to your bottle. So there's this other issue that has come up um, about pizza boxes, right? And, you know, uh, are pizza boxes recyclable? Well, if they're clean, they don't want to have grease. Some say they are. Some say, well, it can have grease on it. You can put that on the recycle bin. Um, I am just, you know, I found this website. I, you know, I dug around myself. I'm a researcher. Like I love to study things. I want to know what kind of research has been done, who paid for that research, who conducted the research, the whole nine. Um, and there is a, a study that was done by a, um, a group called West Rock. And they're a part of the American Forest and Paper. They're associated with the American Forest and Paper Association. A research, you know, research came out last year that grease and even a little bit of pizza is not a big deal. So, um, you know, in, in the state of Connecticut, if you look at Recycle CT site, if you put in pizza box, it's going to say you can put it in the recycling if it does not contain food residue. The liner should go in the trash. So food residue is, is not a highly defined term here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So what I have been doing, um, I, because I'm just a little bit paranoid, I take the clean top off my pizza box as long as it doesn't have grease. I put that in my recycling bin and I put the rest into the trash. Um, you, you know, there might be some folks in the call that, that have other thoughts. You know, we live in the Northeast. We're a big pizza eaters, right? So I think it's kind of, uh, it's something to think about. Jen, do you have um, any insight into this? Not really, no. <laughs> what do you do with your pizza box? <laughs> um, I generally take a look at it and depending on, I mean, it's just sort of an assessment with grease. If I get a really gross pizza that is like soaked in the middle, I'll usually tear around the edges and I'll rip that up and put it in my compost. But it seems like there's a, a gray area. Usually what we tell students at Wesleyan is just make sure there's no pizza in the box. Eat the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. All right. Uh, I'm going to look at the chat. Um, great resources. So what questions you all have for me? Um, or anybody else that might be on this call? That, you know, there's a lot of knowledgeable people here. I have one more thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, textiles is something that is uh, a huge part of our waste stream. They say that the average American throws away about 81 pounds of textiles a year. And right now, I think only 15% of all textiles are recyclable. So I don't know what, fac what facilities you, Ron, have where you live or other places. But we here in West Hartford at our recycling center have Bay State Textiles that has a collection bin. Um, there's a lot of places where there's bins where you can put it and keeping that out of our waste stream is great and, and having it be recycled. We also have the pink bag program in West Hartford. I don't know what other, if other towns have that, but make use of that. That keeps a lot out of, and of course, donate to the dog pound if you have a towel, you know, do all those things, reuse it first. But um, yep. that was one thought I had. No, that's great. And I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we have, I live in Stratford. We also have the pink bag program, although I have not been able to get the city to get me another pink bag. And so I have a bit of a stockpile. Um, before Stratford did this, what I used to do is um, send my, I, through ThreadUp, I don't know if you all are familiar with ThreadUp, it's an online thrift shop. And um, you can order uh, a bag. They will send you an empty bag and you can stuff it as full as you can possibly make it. Um, they will consign any of the items that are consignable. 
Um, but anything that they um, cannot sell, they do recycle and they have a, a very strong um, textile recycling program. So if you don't have that as an option, you know, a textile recycling option where you live, um, then that, that is a potential option. Um, Goodwill, I did some research. Goodwill says they recycle the items that they can sell textile wise, but I have not been able to get anybody to tell me how that really works. Um, so I do love um, donations. I thrift shop myself, um, but uh, I, I also know that not everything that I um, no longer want to use will want to be worn by anybody else either. And I don't want to put that in the trash. So um, this is just amazing where we've come in our society. And I love how um, resourceful some retailers are getting. Um, but our, our producers still have not taken on enough responsibility, in my opinion, for recycling the products that they produce. And so I think it is our responsibility, unfortunately, as consumers to work hard, to figure out other ways that we can reduce our waste and hold producers' feet to the fire. I have a little bit of an email writing campaign to GE. I have a GE refrigerator that has um, the, the water filter on it, right? So I, I use that. Um, they used to have a recycling program for the refrigerator water filters, but they ended it. I don't know why they ended it, but it upsets me because now it's my burden that, that I've got this big thick plastic and whoever knows what else is in this filter. And I'm not re-throwing them away. I am, I like, I, did, I don't hear anything back, um, but I'm holding on to those darn things until I can find a better way to dispose of them. Um, I guess I'm wishful thinking that they'll bring that program back. Um, but if you know, we, if there's enough of us that are complaining to um, the manufacturers of the products um, that you know they're making a whole lot of money off of us, um, it wouldn't cost them a whole lot of money to do the right thing by helping us responsibly dispose of the items that they you know they they want us to buy. So. No questions in the chat, but um, something that Ron pointed out is that shredded paper. If you try to put it in your recycling, it does not get recycled. Um, I know Krishna is on here. Um, Middletown and probably other municipalities are doing paper shredding events coming up this month and also several times a year. That's a definite, definitely a preferred option. One, it uses less energy than using your personal shredder. Um, but also then that paper can actually be recycled versus what you generate in your own house. It's just too small and it gums up the machinery. Thank you for bringing that up, yes. Yep, on, um, on this Saturday, actually, there's a pa paper shredding and electronics re recycling event. Um, I also stockpile um, electronics that don't work anymore um, and I bring them to these events. They usually use them as fundraisers. Um, doesn't take up a lot of room, but it, you know, I, I help raise money for some good cause and I'm not putting those heavy metals back into the system where they would just end up getting burned. So yeah, if I come off as preachy, I do have to apologize because that is absolutely not my intent. My only intent is to hopefully motivate um, it is not easy to tread lightly on this planet, unfortunately, especially here in the United States. So I learned from you. I would love it. You know, I, this is a back and forth. So if I do come off as preachy, it is absolutely not my intent. So I'm just going to put that out there. Yeah. And I, I think it's important to remember, too, that um, as we recycle, uh, people may be putting their recyclables in a plastic bag. But that plastic bag cannot be put into the recyclable system. So it doesn't do you any good to put your recyclables in a plastic bag, then put your plastic bag in the in that uh, in your recyclable container. In fact, it will cause it not to be recycled; it will cause it to be burnt. So it's real important to keep your your recyclables loose, um, and anything that you recycle really can be kept in the in your house in a plastic bag. But once you go to recycle it, you need to take it out. Mm -hmm. Yep, no need for that.
Heck, my in 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 Stratford, I don't even need to put my trash in a plastic bag. They just I just put my trash into my trash bin, and they take it away. So, could I just add something? Uh, in 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 the recycling world, we've we of course all know reduce, reuse, recycle, but we can add before those three. Rethink and refuse. So rethink your consumption habits. And maybe that refrigerator that has a water filter on it seemed like a good idea at the time, but it's turned out to be a, a burden. Mm -hmm. So it came with my house. So I wouldn't have made the choice myself, but yeah, but you're totally right. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a wonderful book uh, called True Wealth by Juliet Shore. Uh, who started out as a conventional economist, and she's now a sociologist and an environmental economist. And she points out that we have manufactured enough stuff, particularly since the Industrial Revolution, to last us for a long, long time. Uh, we don't need to keep making things new, and we can still acquire new things that are being reused uh, and use them until they can have to be turned into something else. So I really recommend it. It's a wonderful book and it's not preachy. It's called True Wealth by Juliet Shore, S-C-H-O-R. Thank you. Thank you. If you could throw that into the chat, Krishna, that would be awesome. I'm also going to recommend this, um, an additional resource. This book that I love um, has helped me make decisions. You know, there's always a trade-off, right? About, I don't know if this looks backwards to you, but it's called Cooler, Smarter. Is written um, and compiled by the um, Union of Concerned Scientists. They're based out of Massachusetts. Um, it's Practical Steps for a Low Carbon Living. And it really goes into, um, it has all sorts of categories, but what's the trade off? Um, you know, I could make this decision. Should I repair my old car or maybe should I get a new one? And they have done all the math. They have done all the calculations. I mean, certainly there are things that I have questions on that they don't cover, but I truly love that book. Um, it has helped me many times either answer my own questions or questions that other people have asked me. Um, so, I'm not going to uh, belabor this any longer if yeah. nobody else has no. questions. No, are there any more questions? Please raise your hand or speak up. You don't need to even raise your hand. Um, any additional information on resources that we can use? Hi, I actually have a question. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My name is Datsa. Uh, I think when you were using uh, the camera, your uh, waste camera, where you showed your audit, uh, you had recycled container which was like to go container it was black and i think cheryl on the, on her trash talk said that black pl plastic does not get um accepted has that changed that is an excellent question and i'm glad you brought that up um, I know the um what's that Jen? it's true it just it changed so black plastic is not accepted and the reason is that you know um you know, most things are recyclable. It's whether they're accepted in your area. It's whether there's an end market for it. And uh, black plastic has a low value, number one, and it's hard to be sorted by optic sorters. <gasps> so they have take they took it out because it's a problem. It has very low value. It can't be turned into, it, there's very little it can be turned into. So there's, wow. there's no desire. So those things are recyclable. It doesn't mean there's a mill, that there's some place that wants to buy. And black plastic was taken out last year. Oh, Adase, I hope I pronounced your name right. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. I just threw that into RecycleCT.com and it, it mentioned that they just took that off. Yeah, well, I was gonna text you that later, but yeah. Thank you so much for bringing that to yeah. my attention. The and question attention. Is, is can we make choices where you avoid it? And that's very difficult. Oh, you know, you oh, can yeah. expect your, your carry out place to carry a different kind, but it's- Exactly, you know, yep. You know, and in, in, in a lot of, you know, places would, cer would certainly be willing to do it. They just don't even know themselves. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think there's anything that we've learned is recycling is not easy. You know, the concept 
the concept appears to be very easy. Um, if it's plastic or paper, you, you put it in a different waste stream and it gets taken care of. Well, you need to be very careful because I can only say again, if you, you know, the uh, uh, Commissioner Dykes was on last week and she talked about her own personal experience with her family and they've had to learn. And, and you know, her original, her original thought was, well, she had wish, wish, wishful recycling that it looked like it should, so she put it into recycling. Well, now she's changed because once you contaminate that, that recycling, it can't be recycled. So well, it's really kind of reductive to what you're trying to accomplish. To Michelle's point, it's the upstream solutions. It's the choices we make in the first place, but industry purposely makes it difficult and gives us, there's over 3000 new materials created every year. Recycling companies can't keep on top of it. And so we're made to feel like we're the bad people. And you know, it's, it's, the, it's the corporations putting these plastics out in just numbers where we think there's a triangle, I'm recycling, so all is good. And that's not the case. It isn't, you're right. But it's worth the effort, right? Of course. Oh, They're oh, worth oh, the effort. Absolutely. The people yes. that come after us are worth the effort. Mm -hmm. As my mom always said, you know, anything good is worth working hard for. I love your enthusiasm. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Well, unless there's any other questions or, or advice, um, I want to thank you all for coming. And I want to just do a little advertisement before we leave. Um, if you found that tonight's presentation uh, was informative and you'd like to see more of this produced by the Rockfall Foundation, we certainly would accept a donation of any size to help us uh, support the, the cost of putting these programs on. You can do that. You'll find a link on the, on the chat and you can do that. I apologize for that advertisement, but we don't run on Duncan and uh, we, can, we appreciate your support. Uh, well, Michelle, we can't thank you. Do not recycle those cups. That's right. Uh, Michelle, we can't thank you enough. Oh, um, no. Uh, this is my pleasure. Thank you, but, you for allowing but me. For, for what you've done in advising the uh, Rockfall Program Committee on how we can, you know, this started out as an idea at the program committee level, and it morphed into the seven-part series. That's just been phenomenal, and it's been your expertise and involvement that has made it happen. Uh, we'd still be talking about it if it wasn't for you. Um, <laughs> thank you. So we appreciate it very much, and we appreciate all of you for attending um, this evening. And again, we have uh, another series uh, next Thursday on advocacy. We have three great uh, participants, and I encourage you to attend. Please so do. thank you. Thank you all thank for you, being thank here. You. And, and have a good evening. Yes. See you all soon, I hope.